Bob Pickett is far his way all the way down from Alaska. Awful nice to see you. Thank you for coming. He is a member of the Regulatory Commission of the State of Alaska, first appointed by the governor in uh, 2008 and unanimously confirmed by the Alaska Legislature. He uh, was reappointed in 2014 for another six-year term, also, once again unanimously uh, approved. And uh, also you've been elected by your colleagues as chairman six times. So congratulations on all that. I uh, appreciate you coming down. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Lexington Institute. This is a very timely and important uh, event. I have greatly appreciated the work of Constance uh, over the last few years and a lot of the articles that she has uh, written. Particularly, I thought uh, when you sponsored the event highlighting the key role of the National Guard, uh, that really resonated and I think in Alaska we have taken it to heart in our working on that. Again, my name is Bob Pickett. And I relocated to Alaska in 1975 from Washington, D.C. <laughs> I was serving as the legislative director of the National Student Lobby at the time, and we were focused on student financial aid issues. And ironically, it was my student loan debt that led me to Alaska. And I fell in love with the state, uh, never left. I was a surveyor in the Tongass National Forest for a while. And then I relocated to Valdez to survey during the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. I can honestly say I am the only state or federal regulator who has actually been inside of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> After a 30-year career in real estate consulting, sales, residential special credits, finance, planning, and program development, I was drafted to become a regulator. And that's true, I was drafted. Uh, but since 2008, as has been mentioned, I've been a commissioner and been a chairman six times. And I've got to admit, when it comes to my cybersecurity background, when I was appointed as a commissioner more than 10 years ago, uh, cybersecurity was not on my radar screen at all. I certainly was not aware that an Idaho National Lab experiment in 2007, uh, Project Aurora, first demonstrated how cyber commands could alone destroy industrial equipment. Ironically, it was a retired diesel generator from a utility in Alaska that was destroyed. Alaska is not subject to NERC or FERC jurisdiction over its full power system. We do not have mandatory and enforceable standards on reliability and critical infrastructure protection. In 2014, the Alaska Legislature directed the Regulatory Commission of Alaska to study the structure and organization of the Rail Belt Electric System. And this grid interconnects approximately 75% of Alaska's population. In 2015, my commission uh, reported five findings and made five recommendations to the legislature. One of the key findings was the inadequacy of the current voluntary standards concerning critical infrastructure protection, cyber and physical security issues, and a clear enforcement regime. And I've got to admit, over the last three and a half, four years, I've taken the deep dive into the NERC SIP standards and educated myself in the area of industrial control systems and cybersecurity. And I want to give credit to a number of people at the FERC, Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, Alaska Command of NORAD, uh, ERCOT, Centerpoint Energy in Houston, the Texas Reliability Entity in Austin, University of Houston and ICS SANS have greatly helped me understand issues, options, and concerns in the cybersecurity arena of the electric grid. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the good work of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, including the former president of the New Jersey Board, Commissioner Murat, and the cybersecurity issues at the state commissioner level I think are going to become increasingly important. NERC is focused on the whole power system. We've got voids in this whole enforcement regime. I mean, when you get into the distribution side, which is where the attack surface is increasing exponentially, uh, it's sort of like the Wild West, to put it mildly. And that has got to be addressed by state commissions. And to their credit, NARIC has published uh, three cybersecurity guides, uh, which I think have improved uh, greatly over the, the first iteration, which, you know, the intentions were very, very good, but I think there was a lack of understanding about what it actually meant. I mean, there were statements in there to the effect of state commissions because we're primarily economic regulators with certain policies at different states that were charged to implement. And when you say something to the effect that the state regulator 
must determine what an appropriate level of cybersecurity investment is, I have no idea on earth what that actually is, to tell you the truth. And the nature of our adversarial process um, and various confidentiality issues, it does not lend itself well to that process. But we as state regulators have got to figure out a way to uh, get a better handle on this and figure out what it is we can actually do because it is continues to be an issue. I have titled my, put my talk in a couple of different pieces. And being an old spaghetti western fan of Clint Eastwood, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I wish I could have brought the theme music for that here. Uh, one of the best parts of my quest to better understand cybersecurity and the grid are the people I've met. By and large, the, the, the practitioners in the cybersecurity community are open, intelligent, and helpful. Does that mean they always have the same opinion or get along? Absolutely not. And even though there are very sharp disagreements of opinion, uh, I've, I've, my experience has been very frank and respectful discussions. That's the norm. One of the things that I became aware of early on were uh, NERC SIP standards. And NERC SIP is imperfect. It tends to be, and I, anybody from NERC, I will apologize in advance because I'm not saying this in a, a bad way. It tends to be sort of a lowest con con common denominator type of process. And, and to a degree it has to. Because quite frankly, the people who are out there operating the system and in the industry, they know how it works. Do regulators, unless they have the particular experience from that industry sector, no, probably not. We have to rely upon how things are sort of filtered through the minds of highly creative attorneys, engineers, and other expert witnesses that come before us. But I will say that, you know, it's a prescriptive process, and one of the criticisms is some utilities will feel once they have checked off the NERC SIP boxes and successfully gone through a NERC audit, they're good to go, and it makes it much more difficult to go to your uh, finance people in your organization and say, yes, but, you know, this is the starting point, not the end. That's a, that's a tough uphill argument to make many times, but I think you've got to realize NERC has tremendously contributed to the safety, security of the grid, um, and it is reasonably robust. Is it perfect? No, but I am thankful it's in place because I don't know where we would be today if it wasn't. That, so I put that in the good category. I also put uh, NIST and the NIST update in the good category. And I think the Cybersecurity Framework version 1.1 is a, a great advance, and I am looking forward to the roadmap for improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity, and I will be in contact with you as this uh, unfolds. Uh, the media is a bit of a double-edged sword, and here's what I mean by that. I think the increasing awareness in the public and private sector, you just think back over the last year with the headlines. I mean, it was like nonstop in all different, not just the energy sector, but in all different sectors. You, you pick it up and I, I think when I really cringe is when I see a, an article and the picture associated with it has a darkened computer screen and some scary looking character in a hoodie, you know? <laughs> and we worry, we worry about attracting, you know, there have been surveys of millennials and they're not getting into cybersecurity where this is an excellent opportunity for them. But I mean, if I was a, a young, any old female in particular, I see these articles about these creepy characters. Am I going to go, yeah, that's where I want to go. That's what I want to study. I don't, I don't think so. So I think we sort of collectively have a bit of a PR problem and need to kind of figure out uh, how to, to, to best approach that. In the bad category, I would say the cybersecurity self-satisfaction is generally accompanied by an unawareness of what the real dangers or deficiencies are. I've certainly seen that in my state. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked with uh, Marty Edwards when he was at uh, ICS CERT and Joe McClellan at the FERC to put together a safeguard review of six of our utilities on our grid. And it had to be a voluntary thing. And these are all economically regulated by my commission in a fairly traditional way. And so when I would approach them, I could tell the wheels are spinning in their head and they're thinking, okay, we know we have these rate cases coming up. What angle is this regulator trying to play that is going to come back to haunt us? And it took about a six-month 
time period for me to convince them, hey, it's in your interest to get educated and convince me that you're taking this stuff seriously. Because even though we don't have official cybersecurity enforceable standards, we do have something we like. And that's called your certificate. And we have to find you fit, willing, and able. And quite frankly, if you ignore all the threats on the landscape and something bad happens, uh, that's going to be a tough sell for you. So I think they realize it has to be a cooperative effort. Uh, regulators have to realize that uh, they don't have all the answers. And Robert Lee from Dragos brought up a, a pretty good point in testimony before the uh, Senate Energy Committee earlier this spring. And essentially, uh, one of his theme messages was, you know, we kind of need to take a bit of a break. Because regulation is not the ultimate, given the nature of the advanced persistent threats we have. It's not just a technology problem. It's kind of a, you've got to know your adversary and the people, and to just promulgate more and more regulations until you actually have an opportunity. And don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking, you know, the, the FERC supply chain and, and physical threats and all that. Those kind of things have to happen. But sometimes I think we can get a little bit too reactive to the news of the moment. And we really need to sit back because I would make an argument that a tremendous amount of cybersecurity expenditures is kind of questionable as to whether it's getting the impact and results that we think. And, you know, sometimes regulators are, can be the worst because we're not really well equipped to know what is the appropriate dollar level. So there's got to be kind of a two-way level of trust between the industry and the regulators. I'm going to get now into the ugly. And I, I apologize in advance if uh, I say something here that uh, strikes you wrong, but this is just my honest. Uh, I think the advanced persistent threats are truly ugly. I didn't realize when I signed up to become a commissioner and a regulator that one part of my job description was I was going to be fighting cyber hackers from North Korea, China, Iran, Russia, and, and ad hoc groups. That just wasn't on my radar. And the, the consequences can be horrendous. I think it's important to not overstate it, but the reality is I think the threats are going to likely increase and not go away. Ted Koppel in his book, Lights Out, which has been roundly uh, criticized by, by many, but it did focus the light of attention in this, this arena. And even in the New York Times, the 2015 article that was highly critical, they still had the following takeaway. And here's what the New York Times said. As it is, Koppel's most successful passages come when he speaks as an analyst rather than a narrative journalist. At his best, he's able to convey the complex nature of the obstacles in the way of defending the grid and cyberspace, including cross-cutting issues of privacy, federalism, and the autonomy of business decisions an increasingly decentralized industry. This suggestion that the United States look back to the era of mass civil defense as a model for how we might start to make preparations is provocative and at the same time sober. Our points of vulnerable access are greater than in all of previous human history, he writes, yet we have barely begun to focus on the actual dangers that cyber warfare presents. Uh, you may have noticed in the press uh, just a couple of months ago uh, even our federal regulators aren't immune to cyber threats. Um, er, in March, uh, nine Iranian citizens were charged with hacking hundreds of companies, academic institutions, and government agencies to steal more than $3.4 billion in trade secrets and other data on behalf of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. Among the victims, FERC. So, kind of a sobering thought. I'm going to close with uh, some observations from two individuals I greatly respect in the cybersecurity arena for the grid. Uh, Robert M. Lee founded Dragos with two of his co-workers from NSA, uh, Industrial Threat Control. And Dragos has built an intelligence-driven software technology for industrial networks to detect and respond to cyber threats. And he testified earlier this year before the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. The first uh, point he made was the industrial threat network is largely unknown. I think that's true. We don't have all the answers. And the comment I made a little bit earlier about regulation, regulation is not the total answer because of the nature of the threat. And I think we need to take a bit of a pause. 
And he did recommend also for a new Department of Energy Office of Cybersecurity, Energy Security, and Emergency Response to focus on new and continued relationships between the DOE and the private sector while respecting that most of the knowledge of the threats and innovation is occurring in the private sector. I'm not going to take much time because my comments are a little bit too lengthy, but Andy Bachman is a senior grid analyst at uh, the Idaho National Laboratory, and in a May 2018 Harvest Business Review article, he made some very provocative uh, statements. I would recommend you read it. Uh, kind of gets to the other side of the equation from um, Robert Lee, and, and basically his theme is if you don't totally disconnect for your crown jewels of your, your network, you're kind of deluding yourself to think that you're going to have total protection. Now that's kind of an extreme position. I think, uh, to paraphrase, uh, my Senator Murkowski, when she discusses national energy policy, is sort of an all of the above strategy. You've got to kind of look at it all. And I would also like to throw out Andy Grove is a guy who I've tremendously respected. He's one of the first three employees at Intel. And he was CEO at a time that Intel became the Intel you know today. He wrote a book in 1996. And just the title of it, I think, is a message for all of us in the room. It is only the paranoid survive. Thank you very much. <laughs>